Hello, good afternoon and good evening, everyone. My name is Amber Dawkins and I'm the MasterCard North America Small Business Financial Inclusion and Access to Capital Lead. Thank you everyone for joining today's Access to Capital and uh, Access to Capital session with MasterCard Digital Doors. We have a phenomenal group of seasoned executives here today to speak with you about securing the capital you seek to grow your business. At MasterCard, we believe small businesses are the backbone of our communities and the foundation of our economy. We are uniquely positioned to help them thrive as they face increased pressures to keep pace with the rate of change in the economy and macro environment. We'll we're helping small business owners unlock their full potential by collaborating with financial partners and ecosystem builders to create solutions, tools, and services to build, grow, and protect small businesses. We recognize the power of possibility when small businesses have access to the data and resources they need to succeed, and we are dedicated to helping them and their local communities thrive. MasterCard has made several commitments to supporting small businesses, both globally and here in the United States. At a global level, we are committed to making sure that 50 million small businesses are moved into the digital economy. And here in the United States, we have made a $500 million commitment to close the racial wealth and opportunity gap for, for small businesses, uh, specifically within the Black community. We are really excited to speak to you today because we recognize that there's unequal access to information, capital, um, as well as networks and business. We would like to talk to you about our Digital Doors program briefly, which is a program that we created in 2020 to create uh, opportunities for small businesses to have access to digital resources and tools, and also to make sure that they are financially empowered. So just a few housekeeping, uh, housekeeping notes to share with you before we get started. Firstly, please use the chat function to connect with each other and introduce yourselves throughout the duration of the session. Also, please put your questions in the Q&A section at the left of your screen. We have so many, with you, with the, um, so many of you with us tonight. Um, so unfortunately, we're not able to show you when you ask your question on the screen, but we will definitely pose your questions to the presenters at the end of the discussion. And tomorrow you will receive an email with a survey link to, the, to access the replay of this session at the Intendi Hub. And then finally, I wanna make sure that you notice that we will have a survey at the end of the session. So please share your feedback so we can understand what we can do to help you as small business owners going forward. 
And I'd like to now introduce you to Ginger Siegel, the North America small business head and lead for MasterCard in North America. Thank you so very much. And we look forward to having a session with you. Thank you, Amber. And um, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. We are so thrilled uh, on behalf of MasterCard and our amazing partners that I'm going to be introducing in a bit to talk to you about a topic that's near and dear to our heart and we know near and dear to yours, which is access to capital. When I talk to small businesses, and I'm thrilled that and honored that I get the opportunity to do that often, one of the things that I hear many of you say is, tell us that we're not alone. And what I thought I would do is really talk a little bit about the state of small businesses, particularly around funding, cash flow management today, so that you know any of you having any difficulties in this area that you're not alone. So a couple stats to kick off. I love stats because I think they really ground us in the reality of the situation. So one of the stats that I think is, is most alarming but super important is that 82% of small businesses that fail do so because of cash management issues. And if you take a look at what small businesses say around their concerns, 74% cite cash flow, making timely payments, making payments on financial products, unpaid bills, and making payroll and rent as a, as a current challenge that they have today. Another important topic is when we think about access to capital, we don't just mean having small businesses borrow. But what are the opportunities to help small businesses get their own money in quicker? For example, about 64% of small businesses have unpaid invoices more than 60 days past due. We also know that there are particular pockets of segments of small business that have more troubles than others. Uh, women business owners and business owners of color are more likely than their counterparts to actually have to rely on personal funding or friends and family. And the actual share of small employer firms fully approved for credit applications in 2022 was 58% for white-owned firms versus 38% for Hispanic-owned, 33% for Asian-owned, and 20% for Black-owned businesses. So we know that Black-owned firms actually sought smaller amounts of financing on average than white-owned firms. What does all this mean? What all this means is that access to capital and overall cash flow concerns are very important. And MasterCard is very, very focused on this. And we can't do it alone, though. And so I'm really excited to say that on our panel today, and it doesn't always happen this way, we have three amazing partners that I would like to introduce you to, but also really have you talk a little, have them talk a little bit about themselves. So what I'd like to do first is talk a little bit about Lisa Friesen, who is head of financial inclusion and racial equity at City. City is a longtime partner of ours and a very big force in the banking institution landscape today. We also have Brock Blake. Uh, Brock is co-founder and CEO of Lendio. Lendio is the leading digital marketplace giving small business owners access to banks and financial institutions nationwide. And last but not least, my friend Luce, who is the CEO of Axion Opportunity Fund. This fund is the leading nonprofit providing small businesses with access to capital, networks, and coaching. So first of all, welcome to you all. I count you in as friends, colleagues, um, just so thrilled that you're with us today. And I want the audience to know how lucky you are to have this amazing array of experts um, on with us today. So what I thought we would do is before we start with some questions, um, Lisa would love if you could share a little bit about yourself, your amazing background and the most incredible work that you're doing at City today. Thank you, Ginger. I am so excited to be here on this Tuesday evening with you and all, all of the people in the audience uh, who have joined us. Uh, so again, I'm Lisa Fryson. I uh, 
work at City. I joined last year uh, to lead a new function called Finance Fire Financial Inclusion and Racial Equity. And uh, this is after a long career with some previous financial services institutions serving many in many capacities around the needs of diverse segments from a business perspective and, and bringing strategies together to really help serve. And so I'm also here at City to do that same thing. Um, while my role is new, it, it's definitely clear that uh, this work is not new for City. We've been at this for a while in terms of really thinking more broadly about financial inclusion and racial equity. We'll talk a little bit about the work that we're doing, but really, you know, we're here in service of small businesses and in service of um, customers that we really want to make sure succeed and thrive. Thank you. And I think you can all see why Lisa was asked to be a part of this panel. So thank you, Lisa. And we're going to get back to you shortly. So Luce, um, Axion Opportunity Fund, Axion in general, tremendous partner of MasterCards. Would love if you could share a bit about yourself uh, with the audience. Sure. Well, good afternoon. Good evening. And uh, Ginger, thank you. It's always wonderful to, to be in conversation with you and, and Brock and Lisa, old friends. Um, I work with an organization called Axion Opportunity Fund. Uh, we are the leading uh, nonprofit community development financial institution. That's a mouthful. It's CDFI. You may have heard about us. We'll talk a little bit more about what they do, uh, CDFIs do. Uh, our focus and our mission is to provide access to affordable loans and other financial services, coaching, business advising, and support networks to underinvested and overlooked entrepreneurs that traditionally have, be, have been left behind by the mainstream financial system. And as a CDFI, our focus is really to build a more inclusive financial system. And my personal passion is to help people build a better future by bringing everyone along, providing the resources and let them choose what path is best for them. So excited to be here and looking forward to this conversation. Great, thank you, Luz. And everyone can see why Luz was asked to be on this panel. Um, and last but no, most certainly uh, not least is uh, my friend Brock. Uh, Brock, the CEO of Lendio, uh, an amazing partner in so many different ways with not just MasterCard, but you know organizations um, like Axion Opportunity. So Brock, would love if you could share a little bit about yourself and then I'm gonna get you with the first question. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Ginger, for having me on. I'm so grateful to be a part of this panel and, and to, to be with Lisa and Luce as well to talk about this important topic. We're also grateful for the partnership we have with MasterCard and, and the passion, the shared passion to help small businesses. Uh, I'm the CEO and, and the co-founder of Lendio. Lendio is uh, the largest marketplace in the U.S. for small business loans. So what we do is we help. We have about 70 lenders on our platform. And we help small businesses that come to one place, fill out an application and get access to many different loan options. And then comparison shop the loan opportunity that's the best fit for them. Um, and we've helped fund uh, over $14 billion of loans across hundreds of thousands of small businesses. And we're especially passionate about helping uh, the underserved community and, and especially um, women-owned businesses, uh, businesses that uh, of color and uh, and are the smallest of small businesses across the US and so we're excited for this conversation today no great thanks Brock and uh, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put the first question on you so obviously um, CEO of Lendio before you got on this journey to form Lendio, you had a lot of different things you could do. So would love to hear a little bit about your journey kind of creating Lendio but you know, more importantly, as you thought about this, what were the, the small business needs that you were really looking to address? Because we know for a fact that small businesses have so much opportunity, but also have so many needs. So tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, so I started, we started this business like 12 years ago. And uh, fortunately, during the time we, uh, I had won an entrepreneurial competition and won $50,000 I could use to go and start any business or buy a business or whatnot. And so during this process, I started going out and interviewing business owners and talking to them uh, um, about kind of what their pain points were and, and really exploring opportunities to, to maybe buy a business. The interesting thing out of almost every single conversation 
conversation that I had with almost every business owner that I met with was that they they all had this challenge around kind of access to capital. Um, and, the, you know, they needed capital to grow their business. They wanted needed capital to expand. They needed capital for marketing or hiring employees or even, as you said, you know, they wanted to improve their cash flow, um, you know, with collections. And it, but it was just very consistent, the, the responses. And we felt like there has to be a better way to be able to help these business owners evaluate and get access to capital. Sometimes it's a little bit nerve wracking to be able to go into a bank, into a branch and, and apply for a loan and sit, da- sit down across the desk. And there's fear that they may you know, ask you a question that you may not know the answer of, or you may feel ashamed. My financials aren't as you know, clean as I think every other business owner is and, and whatnot. And, and so, you know, we, we wanted to provide this opportunity where a business owner could come, take their time filling out an application. And then we have lenders really trying to, you know, kind of compete for uh, the business of that small business or just trying to simplify that experience. Um, so th- it was hearing this pain from the business owners that really caused us to be able to say, there's got to be a better way. Let's go innovative and, and try and create a solution. Yeah, Brock, and you know, what's so great about that is small businesses tell us in our research that they want things simplified and integrated. And I think what Lendio does in that front is is just fantastic. So thank you so much. That's a really great summary of the great work you guys are doing. Um, So I'd like to kind of turn over to Lisa. So Lisa, um, you know, it's so interesting as I've been in this space for so long and, you know, very often you hear about the words financial inclusion, and I, especially, I think since the pandemic, you heard small business associated with that, but it hasn't always been the case. But I'd love to hear, particularly from your perspective and city's perspective, why is small business, why has it become such a big part of financial inclusion? You know, it's a great question. I actually think it's it always has been, it's just been amplified in recent years, right? And so when you think about over the past couple of years, specifically where, you know, we have had a pandemic, we're facing inflation, Uh, you know, small businesses have in many ways had a lot of um, uphill challenges to face in terms of making that that journey, right, from from starting to uh, surviving to thriving. And I think it was just really amplified, right, in two ways. One, we got to see both I like to really talk about both the, you know, some of the the struggles, if you will, of of small businesses, but I think we also got to see the resilience. We we could not have come through the pandemic in the way that we did without the resilience of many small businesses. Now, unfortunately, you know, we know that there were some um, challenges in terms of um, the survival rates of small businesses, uh, et cetera, but at, at City, to bring it back home, you know, small businesses have always been important to us. We recognize the uh, the role that small businesses play in the broader U.S. economy, and um, have always been really working hard to make sure that we have a broad set of offerings to so- support small businesses. We've done that from within the business. We've done it, you know, through our um, philanthropic efforts and other efforts that I know we're going to talk a little bit about today. But I, I think it really kind of goes to the point of uh, really having a this notion of an ecosystem, right? There's an ecosystem of our broader economic system in in US. And and as was said in the introduction, small businesses are really part of the important backbone of our economy. And so it's really important for us at City uh, and all my partners I know on the panel to, to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to help them thrive and to help all of you who are uh, joining us today thrive. And, and again, I just really wanna point out that we often hear even I mentioned it, right, about some of the struggles and certainly we're here to help problem solve on how we can address those. But let's also give the businesses the credit that they deserve in terms of just being resilient and, and um, you know, really helping to be a really important part of the economy. No, Lisa, you're you're so right. And I know City has such a long history of helping small businesses prior to the pandemic and then, you know, after the pandemic. And Wow, talk about resilience. Last year alone, there were 5 million applications for new businesses form, forming. 
this is like five to six times what we've seen in the past year. So you go small businesses, you are doing this and you are absolutely um, making a difference. So I, I couldn't agree with you more about the resiliency. And that's what I love. That's what's so neat talking to small businesses as well. Um, so Luce, you know, we at MasterCard and City and Lendio, we've known for a very long time the importance of, you know, community development, financial institutions, uh, fondly known as CDFIs. Um, but, you know, in the last few years, particularly post-COVID, um, there's been more focus and support with these institutions than ever. And it would be really great for our audience to understand a little bit more about why CDFIs are such a critical part of the ecosystem. And you've done so much work uh, in that area. Absolutely. And uh, to say that the work that we do couldn't be possible without the partnerships, all of which are you know, on, on, on this call. But as I mentioned in the opening statement, CDFIs really have a mission to provide responsible and affordable lending and other resources to small business owners who have traditionally been overlooked, underinvested, and really have been left behind by the mainstream financial systems. We're talking about the subject, right? Small businesses need access to affordable capital, but too many are systematically shut out of the system, particularly businesses owned by people of color, women, immigrants, and there's for a variety of reasons. You'll hear many lenders say, well, they don't have enough credit or they have a thin credit file. They don't have enough documentation. They, don't ha they haven't been in business long enough. They're needing loan amounts that perhaps are too small for our institution or they are in an industry that we don't lend to because it's too risky and other variety of systemic barriers. And we see that immigrant business owners can face an even harder, longer barrier uh, that makes it tough to access financial products and advising that could strengthen their business. So CDFIs like Acción Opportunity Fund really focus on creating a more inclusive financial system because we look beyond credit scores which most banks use as the primary factor in determining eligibility for financing, as well as how they set the interest rate and the fees on those loans. Instead, we look at other factors and other criteria, and we really try to put more emphasis on character and cash flow. 90% of the businesses that we work with are owned by people of color, women, and low to moderate income entrepreneurs. And because many CDFIs have deep connections in the communities that we serve, we know what products and services will fit their needs. And, and this really was critical during COVID. You know, we had connections in communities that were being left behind in, in the recovery funds. And I think CDFIs, um, to your point, Ginger, uh, during COVID, they emerged as the economic first responders. And there's really much more greater awareness that when CDFIs get the resources, we can respond extremely well. Examples are, you know, CDFIs deployed about 34 billion in PPP loans. And then, you know, to collectively we launched and participated in over five public private sector partnerships across 18 states. We raised nearly $500 million and funded over 5,000 small businesses with affordable and flexible loans. And those are just two very recent examples. But you know, the need for capital has not gone away. And it's getting much greater, even uh, as we're coming out of, of the pandemic. And as you mentioned in, in sort of this entrepreneurship renaissance that we're experiencing, you know, there was a small business boom and there were a record 10 and a half million small businesses that have started since 2021. They need access to capital and to other resources to grow in, you know, particularly in the early fragile years, but the economic climate is also being very challenging. For many of you, you're probably, you know, interest rates are going up. Lenders are tightening their credit requirements, right? And all of this is making access to capital even more constrained and more challenging. And CDFIs, you know, are really continuing to work tirelessly to fill the gap and help small businesses that are being left behind and will need us as they grow. Yeah, Luz, I, I think that's so important. And one of the things that I love that Axion Opportunity Fund does is really do one to many. So with your help, you serve so many constituencies and it's not just one to one. So I think that's great. And then the other thing you brought up, which is small businesses today 
when they need access to capital, we need as an ecosystem to look at some of this alternative data to help with underwriting. And you think about some of the new things that are out there in terms of open banking, which helps provide lenders with more information to actually provide a better underwriting experience because there's a broader set of, of data that's being used. So no, I, I could not agree with you more. Um, I know, Luce, you started to touch on something and about the current economic environment. And Brock, I'd love to get your perspective. Um, I would be leaving a very big elephant in the room, even though I do love elephants. But um, if I didn't really ask you this question, so with the current lending environment, I'd love to get your perspective on what do you really think it looks like today? Are you seeing banks pulling back due to economic uncertainty? We, we've certainly seen a lot of things going on in, in the banking market. We've seen interest rates. So would love to get kind of your firsthand perspective on that. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I, I would, I'll answer that question. And then I want to hit on something that Lou said. I, I just want to reinforce the, the good work that CDFIs are doing. But the market is tough. I mean, it's very different today than it was six months ago. And, and there's no way to sugarcoat it. We're just going to tell it right how it is. Uh, interest rates have increased, uh, uh, not not uh, as directly, you know, when in consumer and mortgage and auto, um, you know, they go from these very small, you know, single digits and they've increased almost doubled or, or more over the last six months. In small business, um, you know, there's been, there's a little bit of cushioning there. So the, the interest rates haven't increased as much, but I will say that a lot of our lenders have tightened their credit boxes. Um, and so, you know, the way that we look at that, you know, six months ago for every applicant that we, we would get at Lendio, um, almost one for one, we'd get an applicant, we'd have a lender option available for them. Now lenders are tightening their credit boxes, meaning if they used to lend to a 650 credit score, maybe now it's a 680 credit score or before maybe they would lend to someone that was six months in business. Now it's, you know, 12 months in business. Um, and so, uh, we, we measure that by about 20% of the businesses that probably were could have been approved uh, six to 12 months ago are not getting uh, as many loan options today as, as they did. Um, and they are uh, so so, you know, from our perspective, um, it is working with and uh, helping lenders to identify other ways to evaluate risk. And, I, and that's where I wanted to hit on with Luce. I love that the evaluation of, it's not just a credit score metric. You know, how can we look at a small business and understand their cash flow, uh, collateral or credit score or other, you know, aspects of, of their profile to determine if they can be approved for a loan. I'll tell you a story. Um, we are working with a, a, a CDFI down in South Texas um, we've, we actually at Lendio have a, a technology we call Axis that allows a, a lender to underwrite a customer based off of their cash flow in their bank. Uh, this open banking stuff, which we'll get to more uh, ginger in a bit. But essentially, there was a, uh, a business owner. Um, she was Hispanic uh, in South Texas, spoke very little English. Uh, never thought about applying for a loan because really was overwhelmed by the idea she didn't have great financials, uh, didn't want to go and sit across the desk from a, someone and be, she was worried about the, the, the questions that would be asked. And, um, and so, but she had a really healthy re retail business. And, um, and so, you know, what this, what, what our technology does is it, it basically evaluates for that CDFI, they're, they're a bank, evaluates the cash flow of all of the depositors that work with that bank and trying to evaluate, you know, each one individually, what's the health of that business. And it was determined with this business owner that, man, this is a really healthy business. We are going to extend an offer to her for a $50,000 loan. And she, so the, the CDFI got and sent out the email to the customer, your proof for a $50,000 loan. And she was elated, could not believe it, was so excited, um, you know, was able to get access to that capital and to, to grow her business. And um, so my point is that, um, you know, that it is a tough market. 
but there are options uh, for the business owners and to, to be able to say, okay, let's find lenders who will look at, you know, um, lending in, in unique and creative ways, not just based off credit score. And let's find, uh, connect you with those lenders to get you the loan uh, capital that you need. No, thanks, Brock. And and we are going to come back to you in a little bit to, to kind of dig a little bit more, but you're exactly right. And I think one of the things that has come out of COVID is when small businesses don't thrive, communities die. And yep. we saw that on Main Street, all you have to, all you had to do was drive down the street. And so a lot of this new approach to underwriting is so critical. So we're going to definitely come back to you. But speaking of lending, um, you know, Lisa, you know, obviously City is a, a tremendous advocate for small businesses and City alone has a variety of business lending options. So you know, you're an approved SBA lender, um, you know, you offer business installment loans, you offer lines of credit, you offer credit cards. Could you share a little bit about kind of the, some of the qualifications, how you look at this? And then more importantly, how can our small businesses on the phone, you know, access the capital to actually grow and manage their business? And what are some tips you can share? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question and a complex question. So, I mean, listen, all, all the conversations so far has really been about the need to have multiple options for people, right? And so to your point, at City, we offer business installment loans, we offer business lines of credit, we offer credit cards. One of the areas that we've really leaned into with some intention is um, SBA. So we are an SBA preferred lender. And that's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, obviously the, the, the SBA lending um, products are really set up to provide a, a different level of um, latitude across a variety of, of, um, of criteria, right? In some cases, there is the benefit of having longer terms or um, there's, you know, different loan uh, LTV that, that would be required. And so we've, we've been very intentional again about making sure that we're continuing to build the, the set of offerings that we have and, and really leaning into supporting our SBA options, including having business development officers that primarily focus on um, SBA lending. So that, that's really important for folks to know. When it comes to what people should be thinking about, um, you know, the as, as, as I said, the market is tough, right? And so I think this is just a little bit of um, good business hygiene, I think that most lenders would be looking for, right? Number one is having a, a strong cash flow analysis, right? Un really understanding what cash flow the business is generating that is different than you know income that the owner might be infusing uh, into the into the business. Um, you know, we, we're always looking at things like overall financial and credit performance, obviously how long um, you've been in business. The cash flow, as I mentioned, is pretty important. What industry that you're in, liquidity, collateral, right? All of these things. And so if I could give a couple of tips, you know, the one I just said is making sure that there's, um, you, you've done the work and, and there's lots of CDFIs and other partners that really are there to help you bring forward all the best um, financial documents and everything that you need to have in order, but also having, you know, being able to demonstrate, particularly for SBA lending, if, if the, that the manager is either hands-on or that it's really clear who's managing the business, right? And, and what are the related credentials that go along with that? Having, you know, tax returns ready uh, to go, right? Uh, I think is really an important thing to, to have ready as you're, thinking about coming and applying, particularly for SBA loans. Um, and then just, you know, everything that you can do to be timely to request for information so that we get everything that we need, right, to be able to make a, a decision. So I think those are those are some of the things. I know we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, th that's what we do from a direct perspective, but City is also uh, an organization that recognizes and understands some of the challenges. I'm not standing on the sidelines, right? And so we talked a little bit about um, PPP during COVID, right? City also provided, as an example, $250 million to Square so that they could provide funding for MBIs and minority and diverse businesses. And we didn't stop there. We spent time making sure that we had webinars, right, to help people understand what will be needed, um, what for to to originate and 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 what options we had available for forgiveness, right? How to apply 
for the the PPP applications and submit the documentation. So we, our philosophy is, you know, to bring our full weight to help, um, you know, serve both directly in the business as well as a, across our enterprise and in many different ways. Yeah, no, I think Lisa, you know, it's it's so true. Whether it's City or the City Foundation, you mm-hmm. also do a lot of work supporting CDFIs and kind of this one-to-many approach. And I think that's what's so great about the work that City does is that you don't work in a vacuum. The other thing I just want to bring up, and you you were discussing around making sure that you've got your house in order. When I think about small businesses, you all don't have chief marketing officers, financial officers, or the resources. And so education and making sure that you get the assistance and and information that you need to run your business, which is why we're so proud of our Digital Doors program, which has a fantastic set of not only curriculum, but great partners um, on there as well. So thanks, Lisa. Um, you know, so so Luce, you know, think about it. We're we're now about three years out of the height of COVID. Um, and you know, current concerns about inflation and some of the things that you know Brock had brought up. But as you take a look at businesses based on all the things happening, how how is your team seeing business needs evolving? So we know that access to capital continues to be a big one, be it that one or other ones. What what are you seeing? So, you know, first, obviously, inflation. We can't have a conversation about small businesses and the challenges they're facing without talking about inflation. It really is hampering their growth. Um, You know, they're feeling that financial pressure at home and at work. They're spending more money on necessities like groceries and utility bills. So they have less money to invest in their business where expenses are also rising. You know, some may dip into their savings. Uh, A lot of them have none of that left, uh, given what they've gone through, you know, to help with the financial pressure, but they find themselves in a bind if there is a sudden expense like a broken equipment, right? And so high cost means that entrepreneurs need more help managing their finances and projecting cash flow so they can stay profitable. And, you know, this is all happening while they're also competing for workers, right? We are also in the middle of a labor shortage. Uh, There's job openings outnumbering the pool of available workers and small businesses know how hard it was to hire workers during the pandemic. And so they need to retain workers and hire new ones so they will have the labor they need once the economy starts really accelerating again. So it's, it's challenging for them to make those hires because they can't offer the wages or the benefits like major corporations. And also, you know, to your point earlier, Ginger, many small businesses don't have internal dedicated resources for human you know, capital. So entrepreneurs really need coaching to put best practices in place, not just for hiring for payroll, but benefits, administration, HR policies, and more. They're also growing demand for digital literacy. You know, at the height of the pandemic, many entrepreneurs had to shift to an e-commerce platform, but did not have the foundation to do it successfully. And this required investing in technology, marketing, logistics. So entrepreneurs who want to shift to e-commerce or an online presence in general are looking for guidance on how to do so. So, you know, when you look at all these challenges, right, internal and external to the business, it proves that small businesses need more than just capital to survive. They need resources, coaching on financial management, on hiring, on e-commerce, on lease negotiations and more to keep up with the changing economy and the demands and expectations of their customers. No, Luz, thanks. And something I do want to double click on that you said. So when COVID hit, of the 32 million small businesses in the U.S., roughly a third did not have a digital online presence. That's one of the reasons why we built out our Digital Doors program, but you also see so many organizations that are really helping around this space. So could not agree with you more. Thank you. That's a really great list and and super helpful. Um, So Brock, you alluded to this before, but um, 
one of the questions I wanted to ask you is how else is, is Lendio helping business owners access capital? So we talked about open banking and it's a phrase that we kind of throw around a lot, um, but it's, it's something that is, it's really important for small businesses to understand because it's used by some lenders and maybe you could help the audience understand why sharing their data could actually help them to build credit through some of these new tools. Yeah, so um, you know, open banking. Let me just take a step back and define that for our our audience. Essentially, what that means is a, a, um, it gives the business owner uh, or the consumer the control to be able to share data with approved uh, partners, um, and whether that's uh, and and you know banking data um, or other things. Uh, we partner obviously with with Mastercard um, on the open banking. Or essentially, if someone comes to Lendio, uh, you know, you can either upload your bank statements to provide cash flow, or the most easier, the easiest way is to be able to, um, through a very, very secure connection, be able to give permission to be able to share, share bank transaction data. Now, that bank transaction data is critical because um, lenders are using that data to be able to evaluate the health um, of the business in a very efficient way. And by um, using open open banking, the small business owner, it just puts you in the driver's seat of control. I can share it. I can, you know, I can stop sharing it whenever you choose to, um, but it makes the lending process more efficiently uh, or, or more efficient. And as I was talking about before, a lot of financial, and uh, a lot of our lending institutions are really trying to underwrite based off of that cash flow data. Um, and by going direct to the bank account, the, the source of transaction data, um, that it allows them to have a lot of confidence in the data that they're, they're viewing. Um, so most of our lenders are really dependent on, on that open banking. Um, it makes the process where you can get approved in a matter of, of uh, you know, really minutes um, instead of days. Um, and, uh, and for there's a lot of financial institutions that Historically, you know, when you would go and apply for a loan, there was two pain points for the small business owner. Number one, it would take four to six weeks for you to be like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send you 25 documents, you know, all this information. And every time you think you submitted enough information, they came back to you with three more document requests. And it was just so painful. Um, and, uh, and, and it was just took so long. And now being able to take that information and digitize it and be able to say, okay, now I'm going to evaluate the business owner's cash flow by, you know, just evaluating their, their bank data. It, it really allows uh, it to be more efficient and it allows the, small, the, the, the banking institution or the lending institution to now start underwriting small businesses, uh, true small businesses. Now, why wouldn't they be able to underwrite true small businesses before? If they had to, to uh, deploy a team of individuals, let's say there's four or five people on this underwriting committee and they were taking four to six weeks and evaluating all these documents and whatnot, and there's so much cost in the underwriting process uh, that they couldn't get ROI to, un to underwrite like a $50,000 loan that was small to them. So most banks kept saying, oh man, I need it. It's going to cost me the same amount of money to underwrite a million dollar loan loan as it does a $50,000 loan. So I might as well underwrite a million dollar loan because I can make more money on that. And they were, they were leaving the true small business owner behind. So open banking and, and some automation of this technology allows that, that, that lending institution to say, I don't need to deploy a team of, of, of five or six. I can do this with technology and I can do it pretty quickly. Um, and so uh, I can underwrite, the cost comes way down, the speed is much faster, and now I can really truly serve that small business. Um, and uh, that's something we're so passionate about is just helping these lending institutions really true uh, serve the, the smallest of small.
Yeah, and, and I love that, Brock. And I hope everyone on the phone uh, on our call today is listening because know that the financial institution community, technology companies like MasterCard, we are very much working hard to help facilitate the process, to make it easier, to make it better, and to really do our part to ensure a, a broader access to capital. So thank you. And it was it's a great explanation of open banking, one of the best I've heard. So thank you, Brock. Um, I know we have time for at least one, maybe two more questions. So Lisa, you know, as I mentioned before, um, businesses, indigenous people of color owned businesses are more likely than others to cite that they've been denied business funding and loans. And we know that city is really supporting minority women and other uh, underrepresented business owners to help them get the funding they need. You know, thinking about fire and just your commitments to kind of close the equity gaps. Maybe you could share with, with us a little bit about what City's doing in that front, because I know you all are doing a lot. Thank you, Ginger. It, like I said, it is really important um, to us at City. And so one of the things, I'll, I'll just talk about a couple of things that we're doing. So one, uh, in 2020, we launched our Action for Racial Equity. And one of the pillars is really promoting investment in black owned businesses, but we've also supported more broadly. And so one of the things that we've done is through the city impact fund, right? This is our, our arm that makes really um, direct equity investments in double bottom line companies. And so um, we made a commitment to a couple 200 million uh, to start, but we last year expanded that fund to $500 million. And we have since then, since the launch, we've invested over 123 million across 39 companies and funds. And I'm really proud to say that over 70% of that portfolio companies are founded by people of color and women. 44% um, are founded or co-founded by uh, black entrepreneurs and, and about a third are founded or co-founded by women. So really just in our DNA to make sure that, again, we're bringing all of what we have to bear to help serve. But let me tell you a couple other things. Um, we also uh, introduced a, a marketplace, um, Bridge Built by City, right? And the whole goal is to connect small businesses with regional and local and community banks and lenders. We've heard some of the conversation around, you know, kind of different capacity that different lenders have to think differently about how they might be able to um, underwrite. And so really proud that we have um, stood that up and we have 15 CDFIs and, and growing on the platform. And so we recognize really, again, how we're talking about this, um, this notion of having an ecosystem and really partnering together how important that is. And, and, and being able to work with CDFIs and MDIs who really know and understand the, 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 the needs of diverse and smaller business owners is, is, again, this is one of the ways that we're using our um, our, our assets to really help, as, as well as our, our passion and our commitment to be a part of the solution. So just wanted to share uh, a, a couple of things that, that we've been doing to really help support. And I'll just mention one other thing, because I think um, there was a conversation, um, Luce, you were talking about in terms of marketing, right? And so um, one of the uh, things that we also did is there was an organization called the 15% Pledge. And so we've invested in the 15% Pledge. The goal, Their goal is really to help um, Black businesses more specifically get some shelf space and and we know that they need a couple of things they need uh, access to credit but they also just exposure right and so we've we've done some innovative things like putting messaging on our city bikes that you might see out in New York um, and hosting um, pop-up shops and online and really just promoting that these businesses are there again just so when you kind of pull all these things together just a, a very uh, strong commitment to making sure that we're just thinking out of the box on how we can be productive and useful and helpful for businesses. Yeah, and Lisa, I mean, it's it's fantastic. That's why we are so honored to have City as a partner because our beliefs are so hand in hand about helping these underrepresented communities. So I were a little bit over because I want to start questions, but since I'm the moderator, I can kind of do what I want. So um, I'm going to lose if, if we can just do a really one really quick question here, because I think it's important. So it's almost like a rapid fire. What's the best advice that you can give the businesses on the phone and on our, our open streaming who can uh, who are coming to uh, Axion Opportunity Fund to seek capital? What's the best advice you can give them? 
Well, the first thing I would say is the best time to get ready to get a loan is when you don't need a loan. That's, that's, that's one just standard. I've been, you know, experiencing this my whole entire career, right? But I would say there, there's some key things. First, how much money do you need, right? It's not what you want, but what do you need? And ideally, you should be able to show that, uh, that you've thought through that question, and that you're borrowing what you need for the purpose that you need it. And we can help you get to that number. Also, we talked about credit as a CDFI, you know, credit is not the primary criteria that we use. As a CDFI, we have a much more open box, credit box, um, but we always wanna make sure that as a business owner, the loan that you're gonna take, you have the capacity to pay it back. So we're going to, you know, understand how are you gonna be using the money, right? And if you're saying, I wanna buy a truck, it is how is that truck going to help uh, your business generate revenue? Because again, cash flow for us is really important. As Brock was saying, you know, we want to make sure that we have the capacity to show that you can pay the loan back. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to verify cash flow through bank statements. And you know, in our case, we're going to ask for three months of bank statements if you have it. Um, generally, we look for one year in business and fifty thousand dollar minimum annual revenue. In some cases, we accept six months in business. And actually, in some cases, for example, if you want to buy a mobile food truck, uh, and you've never owned one, but you have had experience being a cook or doing restaurant work, we will consider and give you a, a loan. The, the message here is the more organized you are with your documents, the smoother your application process will be. Yep. No, thank you, Luce. And I, I think you hit it, which is be prepared and look at your business as a business. Um, so I want to open it up for questions. I'm going to turn it over to Colleen and Carrie. But first of all, Lisa, Brock, Luce, I can't thank you enough. Um, the wealth of information and even just listening to all of you and hearing the passion in your voices for this. This is not just work. This is your life's work. And that is why we are so thrilled to be partners with you, partners with City, partners, um, you know, with on Digital Doors, uh, Brock with Lendio, Luce with Axion Opportunity Fund. So thank you again so much for being on here. And I think we're going to open it up for some questions from our audience. Great. Hi, Ginger. So this is Amber, and we have a couple of questions that have come in. So we have Janice and if you have questions and you're a small business owner, make sure to also put uh, your business name in there so we can give a shout out to your small business. Um, she says that she opened a beauty salon two years ago and is using her own, and she used her own savings and help from her friends and family. And she's doing okay, but she wants to expand her business and is thinking about a loan. She says that she has only been using personal credit cards is she still eligible and can she get a small business loan if she's only been using personal credit so far? I so bet open it to the yeah, I bet everyone's chomping at the bit. Who'd like to take a stab at that? I'm gonna keep quiet. I have lots of thoughts, but who who would like to take a stab at that? I'm happy to jump in on it. Um, you know, okay. I, I I think that you know there's a couple of characteristics there that are really positive. She's been in business for a couple of years. Um, and so there's just some sustainability there. Um, you know, I think it will it would depend on what that cash flow looks like. When she says it's on personal credit cards, that's a question that I have. Um, meaning that one challenge that I, I think can come up is um and 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 which I'll turn into a recommendation is if a business owner is mixing their personal finances and their business finances, that's a real difficult challenge for a lender to, to be able to determine uh, the true health of that business. Um, so if if she's using personal credit cards, but she has a business bank account and the hair salon revenue is going through the business bank account, then I wouldn't see foresee um, challenge issues. Um, but if it's all being intermingled in a personal bank account, then that is something that um, a financial institution will have difficulty understanding what is revenue versus other income and, and things like that. And what are business expenses versus personal expenses. So in that case, my recommendation would be uh, to open a, a business bank account as soon as possible and run all of the revenue and, um, and expenses through that business bank account. 
for three months. And at, once you've once you've had it for three months, then you can start to get a look uh, of the health, true health of that business. And so um, other factors I think are positive. You know, I think that, that uh, you, I would want to know, understand that the, the cash flow of that business and the use of funds and the amount that they're looking for. But generally there's some characteristics there that are, that are positive. Yeah, and I'm glad you said that, Brock, because we do find it critically important that when businesses present themselves to be able to separate out your business and personal expenses, having a consumer credit card, a personal credit card, and a business credit card. So thank you. Um, great. Amber, and I, it, maybe we can go to another question. Okay. Hey, this is an anonymous question and a little bit similar. So how do I know which expenses should I cover with a business credit card? versus a loan. When should I look for a loan? So I know Luz uh, started to talk a little bit about this, but maybe Luz, can you um, talk a little bit about when a small business owner should apply and get ready for a loan as opposed to using the business credit card? Again, I think it's important, you know, the, the exact same advice that, that Brock provided you know, credit cards, um, and I'm going to compare a credit card to what a CDFI would do, um, you know, have, have much higher interest rates, right? And so sometimes, you know, a credit card is when you have cash flow, you know, you're going to be able to pay your debt because you're going to get an influx of cash from the business. You know, you may want to take an expense out with your credit card, or you may want to say, you know, I'm going to refinance my credit cards into a loan so that I can lower my monthly payments. And that way you have to be able to manage well what your cash needs are going to be. But I look at it from the standpoint of what is the cost of a credit card versus what is the cost of a loan. So I think that's one thing. And then measuring what your cash flow, what your available cash is, once you've paid all of your business expenses, what's available to service that debt. Yeah, and Liz, I think I was just going to ask Lisa to, to weigh in here because I, I don't think they're necessarily, to, to your point, Luz, mutually exclusive, but Lisa would love to get your perspective there. Yeah, I was I was just going to say on the point about, you know, um, definitely echoing, uh, Brock, your recommendation uh, on separating, if you can, and always encouraging people to separate their personal and their business. But even on a credit card, if you if you think about um, the point that Luz made, there's one thing where, you know, you're expecting some cash flow and you can pay it off. But at, even as you're building credit, think about your utilization. So if you have an expense that is going to be really high and you can't, you know, you won't be able to pay it off in that cycle. Um, you want to be careful about not having your, you know, outstanding credit too high. And so you really just want to be thinking about what type of, um, what, it, what is the thing that you're purchasing? You know, how is it an ongoing expense versus sort of a short-term need? And then what it will do to your credit utilization as you're, especially as you're trying to build that business credit, I think would be something else that you should be considering. So, and whoever you are anonymous, you got... Answers from the best, all three. So hopefully that was helpful. Great question. Can I can I just insert one thing? Yes. I just can't help myself. Go on ahead. This. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of businesses in America have been built on the back of credit cards, and sometimes they get a bad name, bad rap. And um, I think that um, the most important thing when about there's so many different types of loan options, and I think we've conditioned ourselves to believe that low rate options are the only options that are good for businesses. And sometimes you don't qualify for, uh, you know, the lowest rate loan. Um, and because for whatever reason, credit score, or cash flow, or you don't have collateral or whatever. And I'm not a proponent of high rate loans, but I'm a proponent of um, a good ROI decision. And what do I mean by that? Like, um, you could get a high interest rate loan and um, buy a piece of equipment that increases your revenue by five grand a month, and you pay that loan off in a in you know in a few months, and it could be the best decision you ever made. You could also get a low interest rate loan, and you don't have a good ROI analysis for it, and you get yourself in over your head, and now you're kind of being buried by payments, and it could be the worst decision that you've made as a business owner. So, the point is. You know, you have to navigate what, you know, the situation you're in and, and what you have access to, um, but make sure that, that you're doing it with an ROI um, uh, kind of calculus in mind. 
And, and a lot of businesses can get a loan, increase their revenue, and there's a great ROI case to be made. And um, so, you know, it, we all wish we could get the largest loan for the lowest rate at the shortest amount of time, but it doesn't always happen. That way. Brock, I'm so glad that you chimed in again, because I think that's excellent advice. And it just shows one size doesn't fit all. It really depends on your specific needs, but just making sure that you get this type of advice and thought process is super helpful for the audience. So thank you for that. Hey, we've got a lot of questions coming in. So I'm just going to quickly, because I know that we're running a little close on time. So I do want to share um, Jackie Riley with Celebration Apps, Inc., Thank you for sharing your business name. So she says, I'm in the process of developing a social media based app. Is the IT field less attractive to lending institutions? Thanks for the question, Jackie. Great question. I see I see several heads shaking no. So who wants to take that? Luce, I know you shook it and Brock, you shook it. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, unless it's an illegal industry, CDFIs generally lend pretty much in every industry. And again, what we're looking for is the things we've already talked about, right? The cash flow, the ability for the business owner, you know, to, to have the revenue to pay off the loan. I think one of the things we, you know, we need to talk about is building credit scores. I think, you know, in this country, credit scores are a passport to the American financial system. And the credit score really determines what kind of pricing you're going to get on your loan. Yep. And um, I agree with Brock with the and making sure that when you're taking out a loan, you can afford the payments back, right? Because we see a lot of businesses that are taking loans for rates and payments that they cannot afford to pay. And so you don't want that because you want your business to thrive and succeed, not to fail. So I would say that you know, go to alternative lenders, the Brocks of the world, you know, the CDFIs um, and, and institutions that really are looking at the business, not necessarily for the risk of the industry, but how does the business fit within the industry and how successful they are managing their business. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And great question again. Okay. I think we have maybe time for one, one more question. This is from Sanjaya. Amara Singh, uh, she says, we had major losses due to COVID-19 from 2020 through 2022. We had to rely on merchant cash advances for cash flow. Our business is now back to pre-pandemic levels. Can we get a loan based on forecasted revenue to restructure short-term debt and for working capital? A little bit tough Who question. Who would like to take that one? Brad, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, um, it's hard to answer that question without seeing the full financial picture. But I, I think generally um, when businesses have proven that they can um, can make payments uh, or they're establishing credit off of you know capital options that may not be ideal for their situation, that may be higher rates or merchant cash advances or other things like that. Um, and it's like, oh, well, we sustained ourselves during this time frame and proved that we could pay, even pay these off. Letter, a lot of lenders will look at that as um, a, a great track record and that you're building, you're establishing cr credibility. And um, so many lenders will look at that and say, yeah, I'll, I'll consolidate those loans into one loan, you know, at a lower rate, at a lower payment. Um, and, uh, I, I, I believe there's, you know, some good options out there to be able to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I know that we are at the top of the hour. And so I want to just share uh, a couple of few things before we wrap up and I'll turn it over to Ginger, uh, to close out, but want to thank everyone again for joining this session, but I wanted to just share with you that um, in addition to our access to capital session that we have today, we will also be hosting on June 6, a social media marketing webinar. So we understand the importance of marketing a business and at Digital Doors, which you can find it at www.mastercard.us backslash digital doors. We have a new marketing hub where you can find 
lots of educational information, resources, tools, and partner offers to help you increase your brand as well as your business. So thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Ginger uh, for to wrap it up. So thank you so very much. Great. And thank you to Amber and Colleen and Carrie for the great work on this. Um, Lisa, Brock, and Luce, you know, I, I admire you from afar. I admire you close as a partner. Um, I, I can't tell you how much your guidance and education and support of the small business segment means to, to not just MasterCard, but to the businesses and to the businesses on the phone. Congratulations, because you're here. You made it through. You are here. I'm hoping that you're all thriving, but know that the small business ecosystem has the wind at your back and we are here to serve you. We're excited about what is to come for you and know that we believe that small business is big business and you are very, very important to an awful lot of people as is evidenced by the amazing panelists that we were able to bring to the table today. So thank you to everyone. Um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day or your evening. And we look forward to spending more time with you um, on behalf of MasterCard and our Digital Doors program and our phenomenal panelists. We thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was very You guys nice. were so awesome. Oh. You guys, I, I guess I, I someone muted.